My name is Marcin Hruszczel. I'm the event manager of Nova Confederacja. And I would like to welcome you at the international debate called A New Bipolar Order with a question mark. The debate is uh, supported by the National Freedom Institute, Center for Civil Society Development, uh, from the Civil Society Organization's Development Program 2018-2030. And uh, I would like to also invite you to sign into our newsletter list. Uh, it will be given here. Uh, and of course, subscribe to our channel at the uh, YouTube. And I would like to introduce our moderator, uh, who will, of course, introduce to you all our distinguished panelists. And our moderator uh, tonight is Mr. Michał Baranowski. He writes and speaks extensively on NATO and US-China relations. So I give the uh, floor to Mr. Baranowski. Uh, and uh, I wish you a great debate. Uh, feel free to ask questions at the end. Thank you very much. Oh, super. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, it's fantastic to be uh, here with you. It's congratulations to Nova Confederacja for pulling together a great group uh, and hopefully an interesting conversation and a debate on a really key, uh, key question of the day. Um, uh, as a um, colleague said, uh, my name is Michał Baranowski, head of the GMF Warsaw office. Let me briefly go through our panelists and then we'll open it up. Um, keep your questions for right now. Uh, we'll have a conversation among the panelists and then in about 45 minutes to an hour, open it up. Um, so we have with us uh, Uli Speck, uh, senior fellow at the German Marshall Fund of the United States. Uh, Germany more widely, uh, Bartłomiej Radziejewski, head of Nova Confederacja and our host, uh, Professor Tuncio at the, from the Norwegian Institute of Defense uh, Studies, and I know I'm mispronouncing your name slightly, but that sort of uh, got stuck, and uh, Dr. Jacek Bartosiak, CEO of Strategy and Future with Potomac Foundation, and uh, some of you might know he's with us here despite actually uh, celebrating birthday. So, particular, <laughs> showing particular dedication to the, to the important discussion we have today. We are meeting uh, at the end of the year, right, at the, right after the London summit of NATO, at a time where the debates about European security are very much uh, deeply pronounced. The questions about transatlantic alliance are very much pronounced. But really, what's very clearly behind all of these debates is the po position of China and Chinese-American uh, competition, and potentially even more than um, competition, maybe confrontation. Oh, this works better a little bit now. And we are here to discuss exactly this issue, because we are seeing that the world is changing. Uh, we're here to debate the direction in, in, which, in which it's changing, the impact it will have, uh, it's having already on, on Europe, uh, the impact on the West, and ultimately also the impact on, on Poland and how Poland should act in this changing geopolitical environment. Um, I want to go first uh, with a question to Professor uh, Tuncio. Uh, and, and really, I would like us all to, to, to debate this a little bit. Uh, are we there yet? Are we already in the bipolar order? Are we cre seeing a creation of this order, or is it already something that uh, is existing? Um, we are seeing the relative American decline and rise of China. but. Help us, um, help us position us where we are in, in, in terms of the, the scale of the changes that we can already observe. Over to you. Well, thank you. Um, do you hear me? Is this on? Yeah? Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me here. It's, uh, it's great to be here. And um, on the specific question you ask, I, uh, I published a book last year where I do argue that we are at the starting point of a new bipolar international system. It is a slightly different from a bipolar order. So I think it's very useful to clarify that first. 
the international order is something very different from a bipolar system. So my argument is that we have a new bipolar system with the United States and China as two superpowers that are much more powerful than all the other states. And the reason why we have come to that point is because the power gap between China and the United States is narrowing. But China is not as powerful as the United States. But during the previous bipolar system, the Soviet Union was never as powerful as the United States. But the other aspect of the power transition or the distribution of power in the international system is that China has become so much more powerful than any other states. So the gap between China and the rest, whoever you want to measure it against, Russia, Japan, India, Germany, Great Britain, whoever, it's just become huge. And this is also very similar to the starting point of the previous bipolar system, where the gap between the Soviet Union and the United Kingdom became very large. So in 1945, we have three great powers, the United States, the Soviet Union, and the United Kingdoms, Roosevelt, Churchill, Stalin. But only five years later, in 1950, we talked about superpowers for the first time. It was clear that the United States and the Soviet Union was much more powerful than all the others. And I think we have seen a similar power transition today. So I'll argue that we are at the starting point of this new bipolar system. When it comes to the order, it's much more different. An international order is clearly changing if we ever had an international order. The United States-led liberal Western order was never any sort of universal order. And we are basically talking about a mosaic of orders. There is an order in Europe led by the U uh, European Union. There is probably an uh, order in, um, in, in uh, the former Soviet republics led by Russia. There is an order in East Asia probably led by China, but you also have ASEAN. So you can have many, many others, which is different than the um, bipolar system. But I do argue that we are at this starting point, and I think it has really important implications that I hope we can um, discuss today. Thank you very much. In your book, you also um, pose a question how different confrontation or a competition between um, US and China will be to the one between the US and Soviet Union, given the maritime dimension of the US-Chinese uh, competition. But we'll come back to this. I want to continue on this sort of question of, of, of uh, uh, creation of a new bipolar, uh, bipolar order uh, with you, uh, Jacek, and then we'll go to Uli. Uh, also, thank you for inviting me over to this um, uh, debate. Uh, I think that we are not yet at this uh, threshold of having a, a dual world uh, divided by the US influence and Chinese influence. And of course, we are sort of sailing into the, that direction and accelerating, actually. Or the United States is accelerating this uh, trajectory for its own interest, by the way, to maintain the primacy. But it's not there yet. And that's why it is so chaotic. And that's why, for example, Europe and the European Union doesn't have the single common strategy how to deal with that. Uh, so some countries uh, already regard China as a second superpower with all consequences in a sort of a zero-sum game against the United States, and some do not. The underlying reason why, is, why it is the case is that China is a power horse of the global trading system. And as opposed to Soviet Union and as opposed to Germany and Japan, China is in the middle uh, of connectivity, connectness, whatever you call it, of the globalized system in terms of the strategic flows, exchange, trade, technology, knowledge, how capital, money, and so on. And in order to, to change this direction and create the bipolar world and have this full-fledged contest between US and China, it will have to be decoupled. And again, we have the first symptoms of decoupling. That's why uh, my argument is that we are not there yet, but I see no signal that uh, we will stop right now and we will not get there shortly. And it is very worrying, and that will be my final comment uh, in the opening statement, 
because China is much more powerful than Soviet Union has ever, had ever been, and China is much more powerful than Germany or Japan or whoever who contested the U.S. supreme position in the international system ever was. And that's going to be a hell of a ride uh, for the world system to either adjust or regroup or, in, in case of the United States, to oppose the rise of China. Thanks. Uli. I hope it's on, yes. Thank you for having me. Um, I was expecting to hear that we're living already in a bipolar system and was ready to uh, disagree with this proposition, but I, I actually agree with both um, uh, contributions that we are not there yet. We are, the situation is in flux. I very much like your distinction between system and order. And um, I think what we, we are in, in the middle of something we don't know what this something is. We, but we see already how this is shaping perceptions and also actions. So one example is the French President Macron, who has laid out in his speech to the ambassadors, I think in August after the G7 summit, and then in his Economist interview, a broad worldview where he uh, basically says um, there are going to be two poles, and we, Europe, need to be a third pole in this new multipolar world between the US on the one side and China on the other side. And then if we look at the world as poles, Russia, in Macron's analysis, is weak, and it can be brought into the European pole. So that's, why, what's, that's what's driving his efforts um, to, for example, solve the Ukraine conflict, Normandy format. So we see this expectation of a multipolar world is already shaping policy, and it's shaping a narrative that is very, very becoming more and more dominant in Europe that we need to unite because China is there, the US is there, and it's a multipolar world, uh, and Europe needs to figure out where it stands in this world. So. On the one hand, we have a very open situation. We see the US is not really w willing anymore to fully sponsor the old order, or the, the order that is existing, because simply the burden is getting too high. China is challenging China, uh, American pri primacy in the South China Sea and other areas. We see Russia is becoming more difficult. So all this is becoming more difficult to handle. The Middle East is, is a mess. Americans are looking at this and are saying, well, why, why should we be in charge? Um, so this, the situation is fluid. <clears throat> New ideas bubble up, but I don't think we have yet a situation like in 1947 where there was a broad agreement that an iron curtain has uh, came down in the east and we're living now in a bipolar world. Um, but, but the interesting thing is narratives are, are shaping uh, policies already. I agree with you and I think that uh, what is important to add that we are between two parallel realities just by now, I think. Perhaps uh, some of you uh, have watched some science fiction movies or read the science fiction books uh, with the uh, with a theme of uh, parallel universes and the hero in some situations the hero uh, witnesses uh, is in one universe okay and uh, witnesses uh, some kind of anomaly with uh, elements of another universe occurring in this first universe and i think it is a uh, it is a proposition of metaphoric description of the situation. We are uh, in both realities at the same time. Uh, all the institutional, political, economical framework, uh, normative uh, framework um, built for the unilateral world uh, still exists. And at the same time, um, uh, the shapes of uh, new bipolar system are emerging. Uh, and uh, 
we are witnessing uh, uh, distortions in the international system, which is because of that, because of this clash of two worlds. Uh, all the institutions still exist, but they are no longer uh, adequate to a new reality and new dynamics of the situation. And, uh, of course, two main polars are uh, US and China, and uh, maybe uh, one more remark about them. Uh, US is, of course, uh, current he world hegemon, which suffers a very classic problem of imperial overstretch, and it's getting more and more uh, imperial overstretch with uh, every year or even every month. Mm, uh, and uh, on the other side, we have China, which is the challenger, most powerful challenger to American uh, position in history, mm, uh, which, is, uh, which shows us uh, uh, a new form of expansionism and a new form in, of imperialism, I think. Uh, look what uh, the Chinese are doing. <coughs> look at their... Uh, mm, uh, how, how they are perceived in Europe. Uh, Europe is uh, uh, completely different in perceiving Chinese behavior than, uh, than America. Uh, no one in Europe, no non leader in Europe, uh, is so afraid of China uh, as uh, American leaders are. Mm, and uh, this is because this new form of expansionism is very cunning, sophisticated, and very soft. Uh, Chinese, the Chinese are bringing to Europe uh, prosperity, money, they are building infrastructure, they are giving cheaper technology, and, all, and so on. Uh, and uh, uh, you, even the United States uh, was, for, for many, many years, was unable to realize what is happening. And now it is a problem of division between, uh, uh, between United States and Europe, uh, where uh, uh, United States are very, very much uh, aware of the threat to their uh, global supremacy, and Europe uh, thinks on it quite different, uh, not perceiving uh, China as a similar threat. Uh, maybe that would be enough for now. Thank, thank you very much. I mean, I think we, we absolutely have to come back to the, to the, to the debate in, in Europe. I, will, I, will, you know, I would push back on some of the points you made that Europe is totally not on the same page because if we look at, I, I, I would, you know, certainly the, the debates in Europe and US are, are different, but you, Europe is moving a little bit when it comes to describing China as a systemic competi competitor the mentioning of China in, uh, in the NATO communique and, and most importantly the 5G debate. But I think it's key that we come back to it, to what extent we can come up uh, on a, uh, for a single position across very different both threat and opportunities perceptions across Europe. But I'm, I'm very struck by the, the fact that you actually all agree that we are not there yet, but that we are heading there uh, through this t turbulent water that is not an order, but it's a system. So possibly actually having the moment of this order uh, in, the, in the meantime. Uh, I, I, I want to move a little bit to the, to the question of uh, moving the clock a little bit forward uh, and, and also ask you about other powers that we haven't yet mentioned too much. Um, uh, I mean, China right now is for the most part uh, somewhat alone when it comes to uh, system of alliances. U.S. can, on one hand, has, uh, has alliance uh, in Europe, NATO, but also has bilateral alliances with Korea, uh, Japan, uh, and Australia. And then we also have India in the neighborhood. So, so one question I would have uh, is, you know, how do you see uh, the other direct allies of the United States play in this, uh, in this uh, competition? What do we do about another heavy weight player that is rising, at least in terms of populations, economy, India, that is not ex exactly aligned? Um, but you know, do we do we make do, if do we really can we really extend this line straight into just bipolarity, or do uh, with China really enjoying the unipolar sort of moment in Asia, or or is this picture a little bit more more complicated? 
and then the, the other question to this is also the kind of um, US-Chinese competition that you would uh, expect um, in all spheres. And, and feel free to, to react to each other. So we'll, we are getting into more disorganized part of the, of the conversation when you can. Uh, but I want to throw in a couple of the other uh, powers, of course, not at the same level. And maybe we'll go in a different order. Maybe, Jacek, we'll start with, with you this time. OK, it's, of course, a very good set of, set of questions. I hope that I'll, I'll do my best to, to address some of, uh, of the issues that you raised. It is true that maybe the greatest advantage that the United States is uh, enjoying is a sort of a network of alliances uh, that began in the aftermath of the Second World War, and it has been quite a solid structure. Of course, it looked different in Asia. It was hub and spoke system, uh, bilateral relations, uh, US, Japan, and maybe in a spoke you know, way, uh, some uh, parallel relations between uh, regional allies and collective system in Europe. I think what we are witnessing now, especially in Europe, is uh, that the hub and spoke system originating from Asia is being, uh, is being more and more uh, in, uh, in the making in Europe. Uh, United States, because it, it ha doesn't have resources and there is no or at least there has not been so far the common goal what NATO should be, and of course it was underfunded. So it it was uh, it, it it went astray into the hub and spoke system more or less, yeah. And that was also a danger for the cohesion of NATO. That's another subject. I don't want to go into the side side uh, debate about it, but it, it, it's an important one, especially for Poland and Germany and the cohesion of NATO and the NATO Eastern flank. So maybe we'll get back to it. And I think it also comes from the structural change that China is making on the world, by the way. So, uh, but I think that the, 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 the gravity of situation uh, today is so, uh, is so uh, you know, heavy and uh, imposing that the existing structure of alliances will collapse of the United States. Of course, on surface it doesn't, but it will, especially if there will be an escalation of confrontation, a real ban on strategic flows between China and the United States. That will tax the Western social contract to the fullest possible extent. If China will not be allowed to produce to the Western markets or to export raw materials from Australia, that will have to break the social contract. I don't say that it will break the West. I'm saying that it will change almost everything. And I don't know what will emerge from that. And uh, that's why it, the situation is completely different from the Cannon's time of containment strategy against Soviet Union because Soviet Union was not interconnected. It didn't matter uh, in the economy uh, of uh, the world, and China matters, and it is growing. And actually, in Asia, it's all about China. China is the epicenter of the Asian system, uh, whether we like it or not. India is no match for China, plus it is more uh, and well into the future. It will not be a match. And also, it's not the... Uh, it's, uh, how to phrase it, the, 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 the India doesn't want simply to be the, uh, a strictly related ally to the United States. It has its own game, and Russia is also playing some cards in India as well. So it's a more complex, and another side topic to, be, to debate in, in detail. My judgment, uh, three years ago, before Donald Trump walked into the, uh, the White House, was that the United States would cease to be a leader. It will still, it, it, in, my, in my opinion at that time, they would be still a powerful country, a typical sea power balancing Eurasia, here and there, coming and leaving, coming and leaving, helping the, here or there maybe with a preponderant dollar system, but they will not be 
stay put in the collective system of alliances, it will not be capable of drawing obligations and commitments. And by itself, it would have changed the entire system anyway. And I also was of the thinking at that time that the United States lacked resolve and stomach to really make this, uh, make the, grasp the gravity of the situation and embark on contesting the rise of China. Still, I was wrong. Or at least my perception was wrong. Because the United States is trying to stand up to this uh, duel. And in order to do so, the United States has to behave in a disruptive way. Because it has to break the globalized system. Because there is no way to contain China. And again, we are entering the uncharted waters of the risky miscalculations, escalations, and, and mutual sanctions, and technology bans, and everything that will put a blockade on exchange between people. Not to mention the kinetic exchange that is already potentially in the air, which is a huge change from the debates three years ago, right? Uh, but still, on the other hand, I don't believe that China will be, even if the United States cannot win this competition quickly, China will not be able to dominate the whole of Eurasia. It's a massive supercontinent with many poles of power. Landmass, there are a lot of people living here. So probably we'll have a concert of powers. And Europe will need to find its place. The, key, the critical, my last sentence, the, key, the, critical, the critical question for Europe will be whether this is part of we the West connected by the Atlantic and it will opt to side with the United States very shortly or it wants to be a separate bastion, a third one, but, you know, based on the continental project, as they call after Brexit, and then it will require the new constitution, the new division of power, and a thorough reform of the European Union. And of course, power projection capabilities, foreign affairs. Or it will simply not do any of those two options, and it will cease to exist as a separate power, as a separate pole of power, and it might repeat then the history of China in the 19th century, when the Western people, as sailors from uh, England, uh, sailed into the Pearl River Delta and changed the history of China. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Jacek. A lot on the table. Uh, a system of U.S. alliances collapsing under the pressure of China, U.S. becoming an offshore balancer, and decoupling as inevitable uh, with choice of EU to either become, I understand, a federal state with uh, power projection, so basically European army, or... But it's or, always difficult to deliver, so that's... Absolutely. So, okay, we, that's, that's a lot to already react on top of the other stuff. Let's, let's go this way. Let's, let's, let's have Professor Tunzio. Okay, thank you. I'll, um, I'll initially do the, some of the question you asked to begin with. Um, First of all, I mean, how many have heard of uh, the BRICS countries? Most of you? Okay. Long time ago. Long time ago. <laughs> Absolutely. How, how many of you know how much larger China's economy is compared to Russia? Anyone? In the audience? Five? Thirteen? Thirty. So, According to IMF, it's about 10 times in nominal figures, 10 times larger GDP. If you take the BRICS countries, and you take out China, you combine Brazil, Russia, India, and South Africa, it's not even half of China's GDP. So I think talking about all these other countries, whether it's Japan or India or Russia, it's not, they're not powerful enough. If you look at defense spending, China's defense budget is, according to CIPRI, roughly four times higher than uh, Russia. 
and India, five times higher than uh, Germany and Japan. So I think we come to the stage where China is far more powerful than these other uh, states. The second point is about alliances. And I mean, theoretically, and I think Kenneth Walls got it right uh, with the Cold War, under bipolarity, alliances matter less. Alliances is quite important in a multipolar system. So Great Britain, for centuries, was the holder of the balance in Europe. That means wherever Great Britain decided to be an ally, that power won the war. Whether that was with Russia, or whether that was with France, or whether that was with Germany. And then, of course, the United States took over this role. So the decisive moment in the First World War was the US intervention. The decisive moment, uh, at least very important moment, was the US in, in, in involvement in the Second World War. And after that, when there was no longer a multipolar system, we had the bipolar system and the United States had to do all the balancing itself. Why? Because there was no state in Europe that could balance the Soviet Union in the post-Second World War era. And today, if you look at the regional balance of power, you have Russia with an economy about the same size as Spain. And if Germany alone would spend 2% of its GDP on defense, it would have a larger defense spending than Russia. So the regional balance of power is not challenged in Europe in the big strategic sense. It's only challenged in East Asia. Why? Because if you look at it, defense spending and GDP, China's defense spending and GDP is larger than all the countries in the region combined. So if the United States is going to be a balancer of one place in the world, it will be in East Asia. If it was a multipolar system, which is not, it's not a multipolar system, then what, what would the United States do? We'll pull back and let regional powers balance themselves, as they did for 200 years. Okay? But when moving into a bipolar system, and the only peer competitor of the United States is in East Asia, so the United States will shift to East Asia. And the last point I'll make is why does this new bipolar system matter? Because we have to think theoretically. Nobody, none of us, none of you, can tell how the relationship between the United States and China, how the rivalry will look like in the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years in this new bipolar system. We have a theory from the last bipolar system, but the problem with that theory is that it only compared a bipolar system with a multipolar system, and it made two arguments. The first is a bipolar system is more stable than a multipolar system, and Waltz got it right. It was the long peace, it was the Cold War, but then on the other hand, you have to do all the balancing yourself, internal balancing and get all these arms racing that we saw during the last Cold War. So the expectation from structural realism is that we will have civil, similar patterns of behavior in the 21st century. We don't have a theory that says whether the US-China rivalry in the 21st century will be more or less stable than the US-Soviet Union rivalry in the 20th century. So I, in my book, I develop a new theory called geostructural realism. Yes, there are plenty of differences. You hear about them all the time between the previous bipolar system and the new bipolar system. Economic interdependence, the role of ideology, institutions, interconnectivity, blah, blah, blah. But the key difference, I argue, is geopolitics. And by that, I mean two things. First, geopolitics explains why we're not seeing the same arms racing and balancing as during the early years of the previous bipolar system. Why? Because of geopolitics, because it's water between the United States allies in East Asia and China. South Korea, Japan, the Philippines, Australia, all are protected by water barriers. In Europe, on the other hand, many of US allies were bordering the Soviet Union or Warsaw Pact countries looking across a land border, seeing the Red Army. And on the ground in Europe, the United States were conventionally inferior to the Soviet Union. What did it do? It had to rely on nuclear weapons. Massive retaliation, mutually assured destruction. This created a lot of tension, a lot of arms racing, a lot of balancing, but it also created 40 years of stability, the East-West divide. In East Asia, we don't have this. 
So we don't see the same arms racing because Japan is not bordering China. 50,000 US troops is not looking across a border seeing million PLA soldiers getting more and more modernized every year. So you have a different dynamic. And finally, and most importantly, I argue it's a higher risk of a limited war between the United States and China in the years to come. Why? Because you don't have the same role of nuclear weapons. Today, the United States is conventionally superior to the, to the Chinese Navy at sea in East Asia. So they don't have to threaten China with nuclear weapons. So if we have an invasion of Taiwan in, let's say, 10 years, we can actually have a conventional war at sea, which is very different than what the threat was in Europe, which was a nuclear third world war if the Soviet Red Army crossed into West Germany. So I think these are sort of really crucial, uh, crucial issues to, to think about. And then finally, of course, this superpower rivalry will affect globally, but not in the same way. It's not going to be a new Cold War. It's, not, it's just going to be a new bipolar system with two superpowers. Okay. Great. So we move the ball forward a little bit on our debate. I, I, um, um, the role of the, the difference between competition, uh, uh, confrontation between um, land powers, uh, and also the you, you point out very much to the existential component to this, uh, arguing, if I understand you correctly, that being sea powers, the the existential component is not not as uh, not not of the same. Um, Intensity. So, but for me, if you, if you could address that a little bit, and I I, I would like to get a little bit deeper into. You said it's not going to be the Cold War. Some people call it Cold War 2.0. You know, the, the, but we are getting more to the nature of the competition confrontation aspect. Uh, you know, I would I, I think we'll see whether we have we'll, we'll find time. But you know, the aspects. We live also in a different world where you can have much more of ex existential kind of effects um, uh, by not necessarily having a massive forces on the on the doorstep um, uh, of of uh, of your of your house, partially by what what Jacek has been saying by how interconnected we are, not only through economy but also through uh, through technology. So I think it would be good to also uh, um, uh, talk about this aspect. But um, but we. How do, you, how do you see the kind of a confrontation? And feel free to, to, to also react to, anyone, to anything that was you know, said by on the panel so far. Sure, many very interesting, deep, fascinating topics. Uh, as to the alliances, uh, I think that uh, uh, some uh, uh, words about uh, a main paradox of this rivalry is, are needed here because uh, uh, the main paradox is, I think, that uh, China is not heading uh, to replace America as a global hegemon. It's only heading to replace it as a hegemon in Asia. Uh, but uh, it is just playing on its own yard, okay? But uh, it means that uh, uh, when it succeeded, when the uh, United States is no longer a, a supreme power in Asia, it cannot no longer be the, also the world, uh, the world uh, hegemon. And, and that is why it is com absolutely existential for uh, the United States. And uh, this bring us to, uh, brings us to another, uh, another uh, remark, uh, which is... Uh, uh, a bit prov provocative uh, hypothesis uh, from me uh, that uh, system of alliances uh, that uh, United States maintain um, uh, is old-fashioned and inadequate in the face of uh, this new form of expansionism uh, which China shows. Um, why is that? Um, look at the relations uh, between China and uh, uh, most important American allies. Australia, Japan, Germany, even Poland. Uh, China doesn't need and uh, doesn't demand any of American from any of American allies 
to break the alliance, to be uh, with China in any formal way. Uh, it's just uh, bringing uh, prosperity, development, technology, infrastructure, and things like that. And uh, it is enough in the uh, longer period, it is enough to uh, be a great threat to American hegemony, okay? Americans are, the Americans are uh, absolutely terrified just by now, at least uh, some part of American elites, by the threats um, uh, that China could be. And uh, this is because uh, uh, during the uh, many years of uh, uh, very cunning, uh, uh, wise and effective salami tactic uh, which uh, 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 made by China, uh, simply the balance of forces uh, have changed. This, we are in a uh, completely different world uh, than 20 years ago. Uh, we may look at the map of uh, the global trade with uh, 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 United States in about uh, 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 year 2000 and uh, China in the, this year or last year and uh, the world completely is now completely different uh, in the term of who is the main trading partner okay so this is completely reversed situation and uh, during all the time uh, United States was concentrated on uh, completely different areas Middle East uh, mm, uh, t global terrorism. Uh, 2001 is very symbolic year because of the attacks on World Trade Center from the one side, but from the other side, uh, letting China join the WTO organization. And when uh, uh, United States was concentrated on completely different problems, China built uh, its uh, superpower capability. Uh, and uh, uh, now the NATO is, uh, uh, future of NATO is, uh, uh, is uh, dubious. Uh, many of alliances uh, that the United States maintain uh, are, uh, are endangered somehow, but uh, this all happened without any direct uh, challenge to these alliances, and this is fasc absolutely fascinating. Uh, I disagree with the opinion that this is not uh, uh, a Cold War. Um, in my opinion, it is a new Cold War or Cold War uh, 2.0 um, because of the, uh, some very important similarities uh, um, between the first Cold War and uh, this which we are observing. Uh, and uh, nuclear weapons uh, is a very important factor here, which makes it, uh, uh, this is perhaps for an, another topic of discussion, uh, very unlikely to escalate into any form of uh, hot war, I think. And this means that uh, we also we are also observing that uh, China is very resilient to um, all the actions that uh, United States are um, uh, are doing in the, in the last year. Um, so all the opinions that uh, China will uh, show that it, it is a paper dragon or something like that uh, are simply not true. China is still growing two to three times uh, faster than the United States. It is uh, still developing very well, and there are no signs of breaking the Chinese. And uh, all this, I think, um, bring, brings us to the... Okay, maybe it is... Uh, maybe bipolar system is better, uh, better term, but uh, uh, similar similarities to the first Cold War are... Uh, strong enough, I think, to talk about new Cold War or Cold War 2.0, whatever, uh, whatever we call it. And uh, uh, all that we know suggests that it would not be a quick, uh, quick conflict, uh, uh, easy to resolve. It will take uh, uh, some years, perhaps decades, 
uh, and this also is a similarity to the first Cold War. Um, thank you very much, uh, but for me, you, you, you mentioned uh, the system of alliances and, and uh, the dilemmas um, by, you know, in front of which U.S. allies stand. It's, you know, it's, it's the, the, the Australians keep saying that they would like to ride two horses, the economic horse with China and the strategic alliance with, with the U.S. Um, well, almost everyone. Uh, absolutely, and then it's a question of how long that can last so far so good <laughs> until you uh you get somewhere potentially um Uli, why uh, don't you yeah. uh take on any of the issues that have been raised and i think the the i mean that there, there has been a lot that you can react to. Um, i would like to take issue with this view of china as a quasi autark entity and the idea that the others don't matter i think we just talked about riding two horses. This was possible until a few years ago when China was only an economic actor and the idea was lay low, bide your time. China didn't really come out as a political actor on the global scene. This has changed under Xi. A more autocratic system in, on the inside, a more autocratic attitude towards the outside world, and I, I would say a, a neo-imperialist um, attitude towards uh, Eurasia, the whole Belt and Road project, uh, is, is, has political aspects, it has elements of control, um, so this is not just an economic um, uh, enter, uh, yeah, uh, enterprise. But China depends on openness. I think this, the, the challenge for China is it needs a global trade system. And the guarantor of this global trade system is still the US, despite all the action at the WTO. It's not just WTO, which is important, and we'll see what comes out of this, but it's also security, it's, it's naval security, it's the ability to have free flow of information, of trade, capital, and so on. So this is what China is not guaranteeing yet. So I think the, what we see currently is a kind of beauty contest between China and the US, especially in, in Asia, where countries like Australia are extremely economically dependent on China. Others like the Philippines uh, are balancing, trying to figure out how to extract uh, the most from both sides. So there, there the, the competition is pretty obvious. Um, but we also see, I think this is the, the main result of Xi's new course is resistance. You know, we see it in Japan, which has become from an almost non-player, a very pass passive uh, US ally, an object of security policy, has become an actor of security policy. We see the Quad em emerging in Asia, India, Australia, uh, Japan. Uh, we see efforts to bring South Korea in. So what we see is counterbalancing. And, and that is due to the attitude of China to the outside world. So what China is, is looking for is ra rather domination and control instead of association, instead of providing public, uh, public goods. Yes, on the, on the climate side, we saw you know, a, a productive Chinese role. We see also a role of China in UN peacekeeping, but this has, you know, put in the shadow by the other activities, and we see this now very much playing out in Europe. We see a lot of resistance against Huawei, and this is not due to American pressure. It is due to the fact that people wake up. Do they really want to have an, a, a, an infrastructure you know, for, for automatic, uh, automatic driving, for all kinds of future technologies, uh, in the, the whole infrastructure goes digital and then have a Chinese provider who is not independent of the state. So I think we have a lot of backlash against Chinese efforts to turn economic influence into political power and influence. And we, we hear a very different tone from uh, diplomats in, in Europe. Um, we, see, we see actions that are you know, uh, very you know, surprising if you think of China as an only economic player. That's, this is not the case anymore. 
On the other hand, you see, you have, we have an America that is, you know, that has provided public goods since the end of the Second World War. First, mainly inside the West, a security system, an economic system, a political and economic and security alliance, and. The, the big question for the Americans now is do we want, can we still afford this? Do we want to pay for this system? Of course, there is imperial overstretch. But I think now what, will, what is most uh, you know, relevant for the future shape of, of global order is how the others react. You know, whether Europe, India, Japan, Brazil, other countries think the architecture that is there, you know, in terms of trade architecture, um, security architecture, is worth keeping and worth um, investing more uh, from national resources instead of just being uh, you know, a taker of these um, public, uh, public international goods. The question is whether they will, will become, turn more into a role of, of a shaper. I, I know the alliance for multilateralism isn't, I mean, hasn't yet had a great start, but I think this kind of idea and these kind of efforts um, are worth watching. You know? Security, um, trade, we see the EU um, you know, very active in trade with almost everybody in Asia many new trade deals, we see countries have a vested interest in this architecture. And then the, the one question is, will they step up to keep this architecture? The other question is, will the Americans come back? Because ultimately, um, without uh, the US, um, even if, it's, if it's, the system becomes less dependent from the US, uh, the US is playing the, the key role in security, at least. And so without the US, um, the system probably would be very different, maybe more regional, maybe less global. So I think, um, to sum up, I think what we see is more a beauty contest. And we, on the one hand, we have a, have a country, the US, that has provided public goods for decades, uh, especially in Europe, but also to Japan, South Korea, other countries who became rich and quite happy. And on the other hand, we have a China that has started to deliver what it considers public goods, but we see that the way they operate, their modus operandi, is, um, is, not, is something that produces a backlash and resistance, and not really, uh, that's not the kind of alliance uh, when you want uh, to shape a security order. Um, that's not the kind of um, influence you want. Um, you, you don't want just to turn small countries uh, that depend on, on, on your credit into your uh, dependent allies. You really want the big guys to be on board. And so, so far, China is, is, is not successful. So we have uh, the US hesitant. We have middle powers trying to step up and we have a China that is not capable yet of uh, providing true leadership. Thank you, Uli. Thank you also for, I mean, you know, pointing out to what extent China is still very much dependent on Chinese, China's success on the, on the public good now provided by the existing, existing architecture very much based on, on US power. But you also raise the question of values with the 5G it actually goes, something that we haven't talked about the, the, at all, to what extent uh, a, the, the, the kind of domestic power that China is will play uh, in, in, the, in the systemic way that we are discussing. I, I know you want to react, but I also want to put the last question from, from our side and then open it up, uh, is bring it home a little bit. And, and talk about what does it mean for Europe, what Europe should do, what does it mean for Poland, and what Poland should do. Uh, and uh, especially to our Polish uh, panelists, you, you, you don't have to say necessarily what it means for Poland, you can say yeah, that. Yeah, but that would be uh, very interesting. Uh, but it would be very interesting. So, so feel free uh, and to, 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 to react. 
Maybe uh, Jacek, do you want to? Did you have a two finger? We'll, we'll jump. Maybe we'll do Jacek, uh, Bartek, and then Professor. The in, yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, of course, we'll very, very informative and uh, interesting. All the uh, what, what what you were saying. Um, uh, uh, and um, I, I want to have uh, two comments to, uh, to, to the idea about uh, the, the, the public goods and delivery of public goods. Of course, the United States created a global system of uh, uh, how to deliver, how to deliver the, uh, the public goods, and it was an exceptional mastery. And in the history of the world, actually, it never worked, except maybe for the last 30 years, and it is now expiring. And if um, it's not so that China will have to step up and provide leadership, I think simply that uh, globalized world will simply be fragmented and there will be regional players that will step up and will provide public goods, meaning security, maybe local currencies, everything that uh, needs to, to be there to, 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 to enable the cargo, the trade, to traverse and so on. Yeah, because this is the public goods. What? Something that people can exchange, can live, that's the public good. And the United States has been very good at delivering it. And the main reason why it was very good at doing it, except for, of course, the people, the, uh, the decision makers that were smart enough to deliver it, it was because this was a maritime domain. It was easier. People don't live at sea, and the United States control the, the main thoroughway of strategic f flows, which is the world ocean, and simply uh, based on this uh, physical space, the system was created. While China, in order to prevail in the system, will have to do it across Eurasia, where people live. It's not a nice thing, because you need to impose. It will have to be imperial. That's why any imperial projects uh, of land powers are coercive. You simply can't do it any other way. We had the same lesson from the European side when we wanted to do the continental way. So this is the tragedy of civilization. That's how it works. Uh, I also want to, uh, to stress that uh, China invented or announced Belt and Road Initiative simply to evade the confrontation with the United States. I mean, to extend, to, to prolong <laughs> the peace dividend, I say, the, 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 the moment when the United States would realize that there is a peer competitor or a near peer competitor that wants to change the system. Because the United States has been so focused on the maritime domain and the, you know, the place where they rule that, you know, across Eurasia, it's a waste of resources, so let them do it. And China has bought a few years. And I don't know if, if it was a sufficient time or not. And the future will, will tell. Uh, about Poland, uh, I want to make a few comments and about Europe, because actually, whether we like it or not, we stay put here. Poland will not relocate anywhere else. Okay. Germany will not relocate either. So. If we have, and that would also touch upon your argument about alliances, China is in the, the sort of the alliance with Russia. And it's good enough for Eurasia, in my opinion. Especially if we take a look at the Second World War, there was no effective cooperation between Imperial Japan and Germany. No coordination of war plans or actions, and still war lasted for a significant period of time, many casualties, and Germany and Japan were much more, much uh, inferior to the United States. China is much more powerful. And it has the, this axis of convenience with Russia, effectively controlling Northern Eurasia, which means that if there is this new Cold War or hot peace, whatever we label it, then Poland <laughs> might be at the border. And the next border will be in the Shanghai Harbor, okay, or in the first uh, chain of violence in the Pacific. That would be a new system. So, with our German friends, we will be a front frontier state. We have Duisburg port already. 
That's why, that's why it, it, it boils down to what I said at the beginning, that there are three options for Europe. There are three options for Europe. And of course, uh, the big elephant in the room about the future of Europe, which was raised uh, by, recently by Macron, is Russia. And here, I want to stress it, the perceptions of Western Europeans, traditional West, differ significantly from Poland. For many reasons. Maybe let me illustrate uh, my reasoning. For Macron, for the French, if, if you want to create a balance of power in Europe and in the broader sense, you need to engage Russia. Because Russia, by geography and military power, simply can consolidate and this is a party to deal with. But this is a wrong perception. Of course, it's a good perception if you want to defeat China. But if you want to, uh, things have changed. Russia, because Ukraine is not in Russia and Poland is not part of Russia, is not effectively not in Europe. So it doesn't have the decisive voice in shaping the structure of security in Central and Eastern Europe. Although the Western Europeans are not accustomed to understanding that. Because historically that was the case. I'll give you the example. The Polish grand strategy of the last 30 years, okay, the, the Polish grand strategy of the last 30 years acted within the notion of the cohesion of the West under one international-led order. And that's why Poland always opted for cohesion of NATO and European Union. We exercise constraint in our Eastern policy. We always acted in the East through European Union or NATO agencies for the sake of cohesion. We even exercised utmost constraint during the Donbass campaign in Ukraine. While historically, Belarus and Ukraine are our, buff our, our buffer zones like Northern Iraq and Syria is for Turkey. And there is no deal between France and Russia if we stop exercising constraint. And this is the risk that if, if nations of Central and Eastern Europe come to understanding that the West is not a cohesive unit anymore and everybody is playing its own game and then Russia is suddenly part of the game and we are not within the sphere of the international-led order, Poland will start to play another game. And that will be destabilizing for Germany too. What game? By using our own influence in Ukraine and Belarus to influence events on the grounds, which we don't do for the cohesion of the West. We don't do it. Uh, while we do, because we are a pivotal state, we connect NATO eastern flank. We connect Belarus with the European continent, the same with Ukraine. Not to mention other uh, arguments, not, you know, not to mention other things. We could destabilize every agreement that was made between, between Russia and France, uh, for example, that would concern Ukraine. And we've done it in the past. So, uh, again, that, that's, a, that's, that's one of the examples. What would happen in many regions of the world if we disregard or discard even jettison the, the system that we have now? Okay, and there is, because as I interpret Macron's statement, is that, okay, let's leave this old world behind, let's move to the new one, and then let's talk to Russia to build this one, in the post-American moment. And then Poland will start to play another game, uh, and the Western Europeans are not simply accustomed to seeing us in that way. There is more to it, but let's go to Bartek. Let's role of Europe. Mm. Uh, I think that Europe is in a very specific position here, being uh, peripheral in some terms, but central in others. When we look at the map, Europe is simply very far away for, from the main front of this hegemonic struggle. Um, but uh, from the other uh, side, it is uh, uh, an object of desire. 
both, both super superpowers. It is crucial to both of them. Uh, United States needs its uh, close cooperation to effectively contain China. Uh, we see it uh, with uh, another de American demands and speeches demanding Europeans to stop cooperation with China on 5G, high, other high technologies uh, on Belt and Road Initiative and things like that. And then we read, uh, uh, as to what you were, were, were saying, uh, the conclusions of recent uh, EU-China summit uh, with uh, the promise of continuation of uh, <laughs> cooperation with China with, on Belt and Road Initiative and 5G networks and other uh, things. So, uh, US needs Europe as a very close ally here. And uh, from the other side, uh, China needs only lack of it. Uh, it doesn't need Europe as a formal ally, it needs Europe uh, as a partner in business as usual, let us say, put it this way. Uh, when we uh, look at the uh, summaries of the trade war between uh, United States and China, and there are very interesting numbers there because uh, uh, when uh, America and China are losing because of the trade war, some other countries uh, are beneficiaries of this. And this is, of course, because uh, all these goods, all these exports, imports must go somewhere. At least part of them must go somewhere. And countries like Australia, Vietnam, uh, are beneficiaries of this uh, struggle. And uh, Europe is the biggest beneficiary in the nominal terms. Uh, when the two are fighting, the third wins. Okay, so this struggle is a kind of chance um, for Europe. It was dreaming for many years uh, about becoming a, a third, third polar uh, superpower. So uh, it might be uh, interpreted as a chance to uh, this dream becoming true. But uh, I don't think it's likely to happen. I think a uh, uh, much more probable scenario is that Europe is going uh, uh, to a place uh, where it was for centuries uh, until 19th century, uh, a global periphery or semi-periphery. Uh, center of the world is moving. It's already in, uh, we have already a new center of the world in Western Pacific and in Asia, and uh, uh, every, every sensible prediction says that uh, uh, Asia will become more and more powerful. It's a matter of discussion what will be the role of India and other states, but uh, it is obvious that, like Parakana pointed out, uh, the future is Asian. Uh, and Europe is becoming more and more old-fashioned as a, it doesn't play the game of a, uh, one actor. It is divided between its will, its decisiveness is divided uh, uh, between member states. It seems uh, unable to uh, act as a one actor in any important political issue. Uh, last uh, separate deal with Ch the Chinese from Macron is a very, very good example of that. After uh, years of complaining of, uh, on uh, how we have become weak uh, uh, in dealing with China separated, and uh, how it is important to deal with Chinese united, uh, there, w there were conclusions that uh, now we are dealing with Chinese United. And then <laughs> Macron comes and make us, um, makes a separate deal with Chinese. Can I push so, you on Poland, though, specifically? Uh, yeah. Just on, on, on that, because I also want to make sure that we open up to every, everyone. Okay, okay. Uh, so, uh, I think that be the, just one remark, one more remark about that, okay? Uh, lack of political unity, lack of decisiveness, the deep divisions, uh, uh, lack of energy, uh, all that uh, uh, suggests that Europe is choosing to, not to be a third superpower, but to be a semi-periphery again, okay? And uh, uh, if it is so, uh, uh, 
uh, what's the role of Poland, okay? So if uh, Europe will change her mind and uh, decide to be the third polar superpower, we should help with, the, with it, absolutely. But if not, uh, it means that it will be divided. Uh, it will be, it is a big question if uh, European Union will survive and uh, uh, if uh, uh, main member states will continue to act uh, uh, with a priority of national interests. So Poland must do the same, absolutely. So priority for, uh, for national interests. And uh, at least we are a bit closer to the new center of the world than Western Europe. Do you mean choose China? Excuse me? What, what is the national interest in that, in that understanding? Let me push well, you a little bit more. Uh, another great topic. Uh, uh, Jacek Bartosiak uh, pointed it uh, out very interesting, in a very interesting way, I think. Um, Poland's uh, Polish national interest is completely different than the European hypothetical uh, interest. Uh, so uh, if we have uh, Europe divided and uh, everyone is fighting for his own interests, so this is uh, um, fighting kingdoms era, something like that. Okay, so uh, then uh, um, uh, initiatives like uh, Free Seas Initiative and uh, all the other um, uh, concepts connected with uh, Polish uh, um, uh, with Polish uh, historical and geopolitical uh, legacy are in the game. Brief, just to take it briefly. Super. Professor Tuncio Uli, um, with, uh, with some time pressure, because we have such a good conversation that we are running a little bit over time. What should Europe do? Maybe with you and then with Uli at the very end. So um, I think uh, my argument about uh, this new superpower rivalry on the bipolar system is, is, is really pushing Europe to, to, uh, to deal with issues that's been there for a long time. Um, so this, the fact that NATO is, have been discussing China in 2019 and, and, and made an internal report on this is, is pushed by this. Uh, it doesn't mean that NATO will go to East Asia and join the United States in balancing China. And NATO has no capabilities to contribute uh, in, in that kind of regional balance on the other side of the uh, world. But the point is that uh, this is creating additional constraints on the transatlantic alliance. So you have the 2% uh, debate, and this is just adding on to, to these uh, differences. Uh, NATO has been through a lot of differences. Um, during the war on terror, there were different threat perceptions. Uh, some allies didn't contribute. So there were huge debates over the Iraq war. But the point was that you know NATO managed. Why? Because European countries have capabilities that you know could, could join the United States in the war against terrorism. Um, there were some shared threat perceptions, especially when when, when terrorist attack happened in London, Madrid. <laughs> Uh, Paris and so forth, um, and there there was no kind of economic challenge where where uh, IS or uh, Al Qaeda were sort of investing heavily in in Europe. So China is a completely different challenge for the transatlantic alliance. China, China there is no common threat perception. We saw that at the, at the summit in in London uh, last week. Um, China is a challenge that the Europeans doesn't have the military capabilities to, to contribute, doing freedom of navigation operations in the South China Sea, that's not what we're talking about. Um, very, very few uh, uh, Europeans are, are sort of very reluctant to, to sort of choose between having China as its most important trading partner, like Germany has, and the United States as its most important security challenge. So they're hedging their bets but what the bipolar, new bipolar rivalry is doing is that making it much more difficult to have the cake and eat it too. So you pushed to choose side, and European countries, I think on Huawei, uh, I do disagree a little bit because I do think the Americans have pushed their allies considerably on that issue to choose side, although of course Europeans have themselves recognized that having such a critical infrastructure 
uh, and being dependent on, on a Chinese supplier is, a, is problematic, to say the least. Uh, but all these issues are just coming down to the fact that, you know, we have to look carefully into whether China is dividing or uniting the Trisonalic Alliance. I have not a clear conclusion, but if I put money on something, I would say there are the big structural geopolitical issues are clearly dividing, but then all these new security challenging, such as uh, China's uh, investments uh, on trade policies, on uh, cyber domain, on, on telecommunications, all these things could be topics that can unite the Europeans and the, European, uh, and, and the Americans on, on sort of the China challenge, but uh, it remains to be seen. Thank you very much. Yeah. What does it mean for Europe? Yeah. I, I, and then please think of questions. Let me know if you want to, or, or if you have comments, short comments, mostly questions, if you ask specific Just questions. one note of caution. I, I think China is a fragile empire, to, uh, to use a term from Ben Judah. Um, I, internally, I mean, it's, it relies on a very fragile uh, system of governance with. Uh, a hyper-corrupt elite that is always afraid of being exposed in the New York Times uh, with problematic uh, legitimacy, with an attempt to cut off the population from the outside world. Uh, and, and we saw, we see on the periphery of the empire, uh, we see already, you know, discontent rising, um, Taiwan, reunification with Taiwan. I mean, if you, if you see what's happening in Hong Kong, that's also a reminder of, uh, you know, how, how difficult it would be to integrate Taiwan to the mainland. So I think that that, that matters too, and we should not overestimate the, 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 the elites in the country are also in, in a state of panic because they're afraid. I mean, th this is the trauma of 1989. Um, it's the trauma uh, of, you know, a revolution. It's always lurking around the corner. So they have, like Russia, to keep uh, the liberal order and America at bay. And, and, and that's why they settled with this economic relationship because it looked like it's politically neutral, but now it's becoming a political fight and that makes it much more difficult uh, for the regime to keep uh, control. On the European side, I think we see that the fact that, you know, uh, China is becoming more relevant for us through Belt and Road, uh, a, a major trading partner, B, a German company, uh, BASF, has just uh, has plans for to build a 10 billion factory in China. We see Volkswagen, some German companies, very exposed. Um, so yes, integration is going on. But I also read op-eds in German press, central center-left press, that we need more decouple more from China because there are too many political risks involved, and there's there's a, there's also great outrage about uh, about what's happening to the Uyghurs. Um, so, so the, 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 the mood is changing. We had the BWI, the Industrial Association, coming up with a, with a very critical paper, which, according to what I heard, Siemens tried to prevent. So there are different interests. Yes. yes. I think that the smaller uh, uh, companies, mid-sized companies, want a security of their investments. They want a stable environment, which they don't get. And which they complain about. So, so the, 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 the people are becoming more nervous, and that's why you have also uh, German for, um, economics minister Altmaier coming up with an industrial strategy. Yeah, you, you see, you know, the, our openness is, is we, we, we're wondering whether we can keep the same openness, and we, there are moves in Brussels to protect also key industries to become more competitive. We see they invest heavily in artificial intelligence. We want to do the same in, in, uh, in all kinds of new technologies. So we see already a kind of a reaction, and this reaction is necessarily European because it's a single market. So once you have an economic unit it, that is in play, like the single market, 
you cannot have individual countries uh, react only. So this, this is leading to a, a more coherent European response towards China, also to a change of the market, uh, maybe even the, the, the market system we have in Europe. So yes, we are not, we are not, uh, we're not helpless in the face uh, of Chinese competition. Uh, we just need to step up more. Super, thank you very much. Um, I'll take to now open up to comments, questions. Excellent. I'm going to take several. Uh, the lady in the second row. I actually have a question to Dr. Ulrich Speck. I'd like to learn more about the German perspective on the situation since is this the civilization of power right now not a huge opportunity from Germany to kind of release itself a little bit from the artificial situation when it comes to military, which is kept, of course, by the American hegemony. And we all know Germany always had this feeling of responsibility for the whole of Europe, even though with different outcomes. But we can see it in European Union, of course. So if the US uh, becomes weaker, and it becomes weaker, of course, we see it even in um, in many places right now it, with the courts. If it becomes weaker in Europe, does it open a gap also for Germany to step up? Which Hold on to this thought. We'll take several, uh, there is a gentleman right behind, fourth row, and then we'll take three for in the first row. Um, hello, actually a uh, very connected question I, um, to the stepping up part. Um, regarding um, the possible step up from France, Germany, all the old powers also are from other countries within the European Union. Uh, do, you um, do you see the possibility of um, finding out the, uh, the harsh truth, uh, truths of the Nash uh, equilibrium, um, that if we all go for the blunt, that we all lose, ultimately, as Europe um, will not be unified in any way and um, basically uh, remain the, the peripheral player. Is, there, is this a question specifically to? To uh, cashback. Okay, great. Uh, gentleman on the right side. Uh, my name is Marius Slepak. Uh, I, ha I would like to have an opinion that it's not possible to stop growth of the China and it's just a uh, uh, way how to deal with this. Uh, but my question is about the NATO and Macron's statement uh, that uh, NATO has a uh, brain damage system. So the consequence of this is, uh, is the do you think, like all of you gentlemen, uh, that uh, Europe, uh, European Union, can have a, um, can uh, can uh, have a bigger military forces itself and can uh, mm, can deal with this instead of the United States as a separate forces like a Euro army? And the second thing is that um, how, in, in how, uh, in a special way to uh, resolve problem of the wars to ref reform of uh, Security Council of the UN and extend it is on the other countries as Germany or Brazil or other countries. Thank Great. you. So life after brain death. Um, uh, of NATO. Uh, so maybe we start with you, Uli, and then, I mean, a lot of the comments are actually, and questions are, but I think everyone would have thoughts on the role of Germany uh, in this. So, of course. Yeah, of Let's course. <clears throat> of uh, course. Germany. I feel reminded a little bit of this Sikorsky quote that I uh, thing I fear most is, is a weak Germany, or uh, to paraphrase him. Um, Yes, Germany stepping up. I mean, uh, I belong to uh, the, the people in Germany, who of course, want to, uh, Germany to play a bigger role, but we are in a minority. Um, so the problem with Germany is we have lived f since 1949, since the Americans decided to, to unite the three uh, uh, occupation zones, make it one after four years. Um, since, ever since then, uh, Germany had no real strategic leadership uh, of its fate, of its own. It, it lived quite happily in the shadow of American power. 
And we had, an, had a US leadership that was, I call it inclusive, it was a leadership that was always there um, when, when it mattered, uh, Berlin airlift uh, during the Cold War, um, and then in 1990, uh, German unification, uh, so America was really the partner that Germany could only wish for, and I agree it's a historical exception, but uh, Germans would like to see it a, a, bit, a bit longer. Of course, there is the, the discourse is we need to step up, we need to do more. I think we had an interesting clarification also uh, regarding the security. Uh, in response to Macron, we had uh, German Chancellor Merkel, Foreign Minister Maas, Defense Minister Kram Karrenbauer, all emphasizing how vital NATO is for Germany. And, and the quote I like most, it's, it's from uh, Maas, uh, the Foreign Minister. This is the party of uh, Steinmeier, uh, Schröder, who, um, who said uh, that uh, even if we don't need NATO anymore, we should sh still want it. So it's the transatlantic link, transatlantic link. Suddenly, you know, we see it outpouring uh, solidarity for NATO because of, of the challenge of this brain debt quote. Does it mean that Germany steps up? Um, I mean, depends on what you, what you want. Yeah? More investment, do more for the euro. For some people, that's stepping up. Means to, be, uh, to take more on more responsibility for the euro, to take a higher uh, risk. Um, yeah, on that front we see s slow moves, but I don't think you, you will change uh, radically the German economic uh, culture, which is quite successful. Um, so, yeah, there will be some adaptions. On security, I think Germany has stepped up in the last years. We, Germany has, by, by numbers, now a higher defense budget than France. Don't mention that in Paris. Um, so. Germany plays a big role in, in all in the, in, in the in the deterrence and defense efforts of NATO in the last years, um, and but what Germany lacks is a, is a clear commitment in also in terms of you know giving making the case for NATO, making the case for the German strategy, which exists but which is you know almost invisible because Germany is not really having a true. Uh, discourse inside about are we transatlantic, do we want a European army, all this coexists. Actually, the, the old German strategy has always been be as close as possible with Washington and Paris, you know, the, the two pillars. And now you see both partly conflicting, the, Ameri the French are arguing that the Americans are already, already gone, you know, don't, don't have these illusions about, uh, you know, you can't rely on them anymore and so on and so on. And then we have the Americans, well, next year we have the third biggest NATO maneuver, uh, Germany and France are cooperating uh, quite happily in uh, Germany, Americans and, and Poles uh, are quite uh, successfully cooperating. So Germany wants to keep both, you know, the, the NATO, uh, wing the transatlantic element of its foreign policy and the French uh, element, which is basically also a shortcut for the EU, because it's often. So Germany would like to keep this, um, stepping up in terms of leadership, in terms of telling others what they should do. I don't think this is what Germany, you know, is, is up to. Um, Merkel had uh, some moments of leadership in the, in the Ukraine crisis. I think it has been quite appreciated in this country. But in the migration crisis, the kind of leadership has been less appreciated. So the problem in, in Europe, you don't have a hegemon. You don't have France cannot run Europe, Germany cannot run Europe. The, the beauty of American strategic leadership in Europe has been that, you know, all this question have, didn't matter anymore. You know, whether, whether the French uh, thought that the European priority should be the Sahel or the, the Poles uh, looked more towards the East and so American leadership has united Europe under one umbrella. Uh, first the West and then the united Europe after 1989, after the 90s. So, 
at this moment, I don't think that you know Germany. You, you have you have the French coming up with a leadership bit, you know, strategic autonomy. Uh, we need to uh, rapprochement with Russia. It's all about China. Americans are already gone. Well. Macron turns around and sees he's pretty much alone on, on enlargement, on EU enlargement. He was al almost the only one holding, holding out against everybody else. So he, that's not leadership. Leadership means you have people who follow you. Um, there's a problem. So the, the French don't provide this inclu inclusive leadership at the moment. I'm, I'm not saying that they can't, but at the moment they don't. So would Germany do a better job? Well, Perhaps uh, some in Poland w would think so, or others would uh, totally disagree. But we don't have one country that can you know, provide uh, the way ahead. So we need some kind of cooperation. We need to you know, mitigate the big problems. And we need to ha have a broad uh, agreement about the course. German leadership in the sense of, you know, this is where we go, here's the China problem, this is how we deal with the China problem, this is how we deal with Russia. I don't think this is, this is in the cards. You see that some kind behind the scenes, Merkel trying in the European Council to bring everybody together to, you know, we have the Poles and the, the Easterners and we have the Westerners like France and, and all have to be a happy family, so this is what she's trying to do. But the sense of strategic leadership, uh, here's the problem, here's our response, and, and now discuss or now agree. Um, I, I don't see that coming at the moment, but I think I talked too long already. Thanks. So literally, if we could have one minute on Germany, so, so we can go back to the, if you want to comment on, if you don't, I know that Jacek wants to. Yes, yes Professor, I absolutely. I can be rather short. Uh, the first question. German military build-up? No. Um, <laughs> no, in what sense? Yeah, no, no, this is not going to see it. I mean, they don't want to pay for it in Germany. Uh, they don't see a threat that uh, justify it. I don't, I don't see that for the foreseeable future. Uh, any Euro army? No. <laughs> any reform of the UN Security Council? No. Um, so... If you want to think about Europe in the 21st century, I'll give you some numbers, just for fun. In 2016, the Chinese uh, commissioned 18 new ships. Corvettes, destroyers, frigates, submarines, logistic ships. The total tonnage of those ships were 150,000. Doesn't tell you anything. If I say in 2016 that was about half the size of the British Navy, it should tell you a lot. In one year, the Chinese put to sea half the British Navy. I mean, it just says everything. Europe, in the future, I'm afraid, is going to be weak, peripheral, and unstable. All right. Okay. I shouldn't have, uh, I shouldn't have let you speak first. I think we need drinks now. <laughs> you agree. But that was brilliant. That was brilliant, that's true. That's we're, true. We're just speculating about the future, nobody will know, but that's what I see if I look into the crystal ball. Short of the, short of the dramatic change in, in Beijing, or war in the Western Pacific, that would put an end to this naval uh, build-up program, mm -hmm. that's the future, mm -hmm. it's true. And the Chinese Navy uh, venturing into the Mediterranean and uh, the Atlantic, around Africa, that's near future. And if they cooperate with Russia and with Turkey, and that speaks a lot about NATO, and have, for example, a port in Trebzon leased out, then we, in geopolitical terms, we close off the inner Eurasia from the sea power of the United States and the Black Sea and Baltic Sea and the eastern Mediterranean, east of the Sicilian Straits, are in power of the continental powers in the alliance, and then the security architecture is gone and EU is gone. Because uh, the pressure on Italy will be huge. We will not be, as Europe, we will not be controlling strategic flows at all from Middle East, from Africa, both ways. And so we will not be even controlling our own trade. And that might be the near future if Europe doesn't deliver the project. But it's so difficult as we discuss to deliver. 
In terms of Germany, Germany is a pivotal country, and I'll give you the perspective of Poles. It's this Mittellage, central position, you can pivot to the east or to the west. It's a natural tendency, and uh, a lot will depend on the German decision what to do. Poland will be watching closely, even if we don't look like watching. I'm saying it on purpose. <laughs> Every minute, watch. That's why I picked up the Siemens thing immediately, if you know what I mean. And uh, for now, in terms of NATO cohesion, NATO doesn't have capabilities to really face the major power like Russia, especially far away from the Atlantic into landlocked Eastern Europe. So there are three countries that can deliver and they're needed at the same time, or working together. It's US providing capabilities, Germany providing access to the continent and the land bridge, and Poland being the operational center of gravity on the NATO eastern flank. If one of those chunks drop, drops, it's gone. So the Russia, Russian new generation warfare uh, uh, diplomacy and policy will be Target, will be targeting this uh, cohesion. There is another front, it's Norwegian Sea, and the passage into the Atlantic, because if it's intersected, intimidated by the Russian, uh, you know, anti air denial capabilities, and the northern Norwegian ports are seized, then there is no connection between the United States and Europe. That's why Norway is so important, also in this game, although it seems to be on the periphery of European continent. Okay, we could discuss for hours. But it's true, it's time to wake up, and, uh, and there are three, three options on the table for Europe. Thank you. Just uh, one more remark, okay? okay. Uh, I, I will br do it briefly. Uh, the real test of Europe uh, capabilities is not uh, another picture of happy family or another declaration of uh, will to act together, but there are some simple questions to be asked and there should be answers. Where is European army? Where is European force projection? Where is European technological supremacy? So, to precise this, where is European Facebook, where is European Google, but not only them, where, where is European Alibaba, where is European WeChat, where is European uh, TikTok, and so on. There are none. So, Europe is choosing quite clearly to be a semi-periphery of the future. Let me take the last couple of questions, gentlemen right here. Uh, good evening. I would like to know what is your opinion about human rights in perspective of technology, technological progress. Uh, because while in Europe uh, we are debating that if cloning is ethical, in China, on the other hand, the research and development uh, teams are working on cloning um, animals and who knows, maybe people in some perspective of time. Uh, in your opinion, is that ju is it justified to say that human rights are some kind of break that holds down the technological progress of the West? Thank you, gentlemen. Here was yeah, yeah. Let's let's do, and please wave to me very strongly if you want to have the last question. Okay, hey. please. Uh, thanks for all the professors. Uh, very. Glad to be here tonight. Uh, we know uh, the pr French President Macron. Um, uh, he comment comment the NATO yeah, is like uh, like the uh, mandates. Yeah, the mandates. Yeah, this comment uh, arose the arose the, uh, many many thinking, uh, uh, including in our China. So. Um, yeah, from my uh, from my knowledge, I think uh, uh, I think uh, uh, the NATO and the Western 
and the Western challenge, uh, just like uh, just like in Europe, uh, challenges for Europe, we can divide uh, two types. The one is uh, inside factors and uh, uh, outside and uh, another outside. So we can look at we can look at the inside. Uh, different countries have different uh, ambition, uh, like uh, France. And uh, different countries have different uh, national interests, uh, like uh, like America. Uh, Trump, when when Trump got got power, he <coughs> he put up with America that uh, America first, America first. So I think uh, I think in Western countries, the inside fighters, uh, maybe maybe this uh, this fighters. Uh, this factor is uh, it's challenging. It's challenging the uh, intelligence from the inside, inside in mm. Western, in Western system. Yeah. So, so how to so how, so how to comment, how to comment the French president who put up with the uh, NATO is uh, uh, man uh, burn dice. Yeah, burn dice. Thank you. So internal challenges versus external. Oh, wait, we have more. Okay. Then you really have to be 10 seconds questions. Uh, gentlemen here and then. I have two short questions for uh, Professor Tunsia. Uh, one is, uh, do you consider risk of Chinese imperial overstretch? And second question is, uh, could you describe and judge, if possible, Chinese influence in Norway? Great. Um, I'm sorry that, that the two gentlemen were earlier, so there will, will be yeah. also a chance to speak with our panelists later, yes. unofficially. So, yes. uh, my name is Pavel Pasak, uh, University of Warsaw. I have a very quick questions. Uh, what are your in, what are your intuition when it comes to 5G and uh, uh, European Union strategic behavior? Great. And the last one is okay. somewhere here. I, I, okay, the, guys. Oh, there we go. Okay, thanks. Uh, so I forgot my initial question, but <laughs> okay. So I'd like to go back to the initial question of this uh, debate. So uh, whether we are already in the bipolar world, uh, I understood from your from the debate that we are not. But I'm, my question is whether China is even capable to become uh, a superpower. It can be a regional power, but are they really, really capable to to become a superpower? When we talk about um, the um, the, the economy, the, the culture, and their influence, uh, and whether they're capable to make alliances um, globally. Okay, great. So please don't feel like you have to take every question. We, we are doing something right because we just got extra 10 minutes from the organizers. We will go in the opposite direction. So who was the last person? I think Uli. Uh, and I want to throw in one more question for myself. It's just that on a, if we were trying to and on a positive note, uh, what would be the strategic wake-up call? How to provoke, actually, strategic wake-up call on the European side, given that we actually, besides um, admiring the problem <laughs> in front of us, um, uh, we, we, we should figure out a, a, a solution a little bit. So, uh, Uli. Yeah, uh, maybe. I think your, your comment about uh, lack of unity in the West is absolutely correct. I, mean, I think. Ideally, in, in, in an ideal world, I would think that Europe, the US, and liberal democracies in Asia you know, would provide still some space into which China can grow. Because I think what, what we are also missing is, is a vision for China. It's not just, not, we're just takers. Uh, we, we, we don't have a vision of Eurasia. Where is our connectivity vision for Eurasia? I mean, the Commission came up with a proposal and there's some... You know, but but this, is, this is the most pressing challenge. Why, why, why don't we... And, and this would also be a way to engage positively with China. Uh, your activities in, uh, in Kyrgyzstan and are, are, are such, and our activities are such, and this is what we offer to Kyrgyzstan, and we can enter into a competition and say we we build better dams or we will, we will build better infrastructure. We can help you with this problem, that problem, and we could, I think, also find agreement, and we find agreement. I mean, the Belt and Road uh, ends in, in in Germany, Duisburg, the harbor. Uh, so I think we we could find, you know. Um, 
neutral ground, so to speak, yeah, beyond politics, beyond um, well, your system, our system, but I think there's, there's enough space and, and, and it's, it's, it's also a lack on our side to address this and to address this, and I, I, I don't share this pessimism. I, I think we have the West, so to speak, I don't like the West because Asia is also part of, of, of this group of countries, uh, but we still have you know, innovation, we have creativity, we have plenty of potential. And, and co companies are stepping up. Often the public discourse is, uh, is, is pessimistic, while in, in, in business a lot of things are happening. Uh, the, we don't have the same push of money from the state, but we have a system where cre creativity, I think, is still much more honored and where free entrepreneurship is much more honored. So let's not be too pessimistic about ourselves. We, uh, we, we live in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a wonderful environment still here where we're sitting. So, and in China, poverty is still st very big. You know, if you look at uh, uh, per, per capita income, it's a large, in large parts, it's, it's a very poor country. So I think we could uh, address this question with more self-confidence and also with less fear. But that means also, you know, good fences make good neighbors. We need to clearly say where our, you know, where we disagree. I think Huawei infrastructure is no question. Of course, this cannot be done by um, a Chinese company dependent on a state that is not always benevolent to uh, our goals and our interests, and especially as, I, I'm sorry to say, but there's a lot of industrial espionage. So we need to, you know, have a multi-dimensional relationship with China where we say, no, this is not what we want, we disagree with this, and, 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 and as we have with Russia, I mean, ultimately we have, uh, we have deterrence, but we also have, uh, we need to have a productive relationship, so I think we're moving into a situation where we can have all, you know, levels of relations, and I think if we, uh, complacency is the biggest threat to Europe, you know, the fear that, well, we can't, we are unable, we don't have agency, we are so small, we first we need to unite to a European state. No, we don't. I think there is a lot going on, but we need to channel our energies in, in, in a better way. Thank you. For me. Uh, many very interesting questions. Um, as to the human rights, uh, I think that we are uh, observing the great shift in, in the world order, which uh, means that uh, the international liberal order is ending and uh, all the uh, European concentration of, uh, on uh, human rights, on liberal values, expanding it throughout the world um, was, a product, was a product of uh, a very unique uh, period in the history where uh, Unipolarity was uh, a dominant feature of, uh, of a system and uh, it was easy to fight uh, for human rights then. Now we move to the world order much uh, more dependent on power politics and uh, it is much harder to fight for human rights in there. So it uh, strikes at uh, the heart of uh, Euro European Union and the identity, I think. Um, 5G is uh, another very good uh, example of uh, how uh, weak and strong at the same time Europe is. Uh, the problem is that in the terms of uh, all, all, all main indicators, GDP, territory, population, Europe is a great power, even superpower. But uh, the problem is that this uh, uh, capabilities doesn't sum up simply. Um, and 5G is a very good example because uh, almost every member state has a different approach to 5G. And uh, uh, Chancellor Merkel uh, um, talked about uh, the, that we must have a common stance on 5G was uh, very, very good, but very, um, very idealistic again, I think. Sure. I think that that 
you know, this is the 5G story in Germany is moving, and let's see what's happening in January. I mean, there's quite a lot of resistance uh, against Merkel's position in her party, led by Norbert Röttgen, and I, I think that we, we will be have some surprises there. Okay, time will show. Okay, maybe okay. let's do the attack. Uh, and since you started, you will be okay, last one. Okay. So I will just focus on um, what would um, make uh, Europe wake up. I think that, uh, let me put it that way, it's appalling how the European powers and this beautiful continent that actually ruled the world uh, lost influence on the world affairs and grew accustomed to be protected by the US power. And it's a very nice uh, thing to run on security on someone else's dime. I don't think the resolve to change it. So my, my uh, opinion, that would be a little bit maybe you know, provocative, would be that the, the, the wake up call would come when the United States Navy will lose the war in the Western Pacific with China uh, that would resemble the Tsushima battle and the United States will be pondering what to do next, whether it wants to retaliate and then Europe will feel completely alone. Just like the Australians felt when Singapore collapsed. The feeling of being alone was felt across the Australian elites and society with no countermeasures. And I hope that it's only a provocative argument that I'm making at the end, thank you. Thank you, and let's remind everyone that the uh, estimates um, uh, when it comes to replacing US as a European power range in 15 to 20 years and $350 billion. So we could start earlier without necessarily wanting to decouple. But anyways, that's my little. Uh, professor. Okay, uh, so China overstretch, uh, yes. I think there is a whole stretch. I think China is increasingly being filled up with debt, bad debt. Uh, I think they are investing strategy is, is, is not very sustainable. I don't think it's paying off. Uh, what they're doing in, let's say, the Pakistan corridor where they've done the most, it's been very costly. I don't, much, I don't think the, the cost benefit analysis really work out, but that's not how they think either. They think strategically about this. But that means that it's not sustainable, I think. There is an overstretch when it comes to um, you know, a lot of domestic challenges. And there is a debate in China about whether all this money should go abroad or whether we should uh, develop more our own countryside or, uh, or spend the money more wisely. Uh, there is also, and there has to be, some priorities between the international investments that they are doing to the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, not all areas of the world can be equally important. And, uh, and all these things will, will feed into to a kind of a broad net assessment where I think the Chinese will realize that there is an overstretch and they will have to have some form of retrenchment. Uh, it doesn't mean that they will stop, but they have to prioritize and they have to do things more uh, more carefully, um, or else this will certainly really, really uh, constrain their domestic uh, economic development. Uh, so yes, overstretch. China as a superpower, I'll take Norway at the end, because if he cut me off, then it's not the least important question here. Uh, superpower, I, you know, this is, for me, there's a simple definition you, you look at six factors, and you see how states score on those six factors combined. It's the size of a country, its population and its geographical size, it's the natural resources the country has, it's uh, their innovation or you know, technological competence, it's uh, political stability, it's military uh, resources, and it's economic strength. Six factors. If you start looking at that, and you look at how the combined score is distributed among the states in the international system today, well, two states stand out by far. And that's the United States on top, and then it's China. 
China doesn't, it's not as powerful as the United States, but it's narrowing the gap and it's become powerful enough uh, to be considered a superpower. Similar to the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union you know, never reached 50% of US GDP throughout the Cold War. China today has about 65% of US GDP. And I think actually economics matter more than the military capabilities, which was basically what defined the Soviet Union as a superpower in the late 1940s, early 1950s. If you think back, the Soviet Union did not have any form of power projection capability. It didn't have a navy. It developed its first aircraft carrier in the late 1970s. It had some global, not global, but Eurasian power projection capability because of its huge geographical territory. So it could reach into the Far East, the Central Asia, the Middle East, and Europe. But it didn't have you know, a navy. It didn't have nuclear weapons when it was starting to be considered as a superpower. It was certainly not a regional hegemon. It had very few allies as well at the origins, at the start. So I, don't, I think really China do mess you up. And I think it is a superpower. And I think we should start <coughs> analyzing the world according to this kind of bipolar system. And then I'll finish off with that because I think it's really important. And you know, we need to find a way of characterizing this new superpower rivalry, which is not a Cold War. I, I do you know, agree with some of the points you make. I mean, there are things resembling the Cold War. And we're moving in this direction, but we're certainly not there. So this whole debate about decoupling, it, 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 it's, it's very sort of attuned to the polarization we saw during the Cold War. If you think about the ideological rivalry, it's very different today than the communist, the capitalist uh, uh, differences. So the Soviet Union in Europe had communist parties that were in government in France and Italy. China doesn't have that kind of appeal ideologically around the world today. But there is certainly an ideological division. It's between an authoritarian regime and a democratic state. And you will see much more about this kind of debate. When it comes to institutions, what we are seeing is that they're becoming ma marginalized, polarized, not that unfamiliar to what we saw during the Cold War. But it's not going to be the same. Because we have different institutions today than we have then. And of course, on nuclear weapons, I think that's the crucial issue. Nuclear weapons had such an important role to play in creating the Cold War. Well, I'm arguing from a geopolitical perspective that nuclear weapons are not as important. We can actually have this battle that my colleague here referred to in the East China Sea or the South China Sea or the Taiwan Strait with conventional weapons. And because the Americans are not telling the Chinese that if you invade Taiwan, we'll start a nuclear third world war, the risk is higher that we will actually have a conventional war, a limited war, a battle at sea, call it whatever. And once that starts, it's just going to destroy everything. The seven of the ten largest ports in the world are located in China. They're all going to be blockaded, cut off. More than 90% of world trade is seaborne. So it just, just stops. The whole world economy stops today. So well, I think, of course, strategically, it's wise to, to, to the couple. So I'll, I'll stop there, and I'll just on, on Norway, it's all about 5G, it's all about the Arctic, Pompeo's speech at the Arctic Council, of course. This is just, you know, another region being polarized, in a sense, uh, by this superpower rivalry. It's about investments, but Norway was in this, you know, very special case. From 2010 to 2017, it was in the freeze. So Norway know everything about Chinese cohesive, assertive diplomacy. You know, they put this freeze on bilateral relations with Norway for, for seven years because of the Nobel Peace Prize. I mean, this is, um, well, it wasn't that the European countries were running down the doors in Beijing to help our case. You know, everybody was just trying to not get into the fire. Um, so again, you know, this says a lot about European cohesion cooperation and how easy it is for the Chinese to, to basically divide and rule the Europeans. Thank you very much. I think we are really out of time, but you are the organizer and the host, so you, of course, get a word. Okay, okay, you are decided not to abuse the power. Uh, well, this has been a fascinating debate, I must, I must say. I'm not, the Polish audience.
uh, absolutely. This is just a proof that the real strategic debates happen uh, in Warsaw. I'm not going to try to summarize everything, but uh, you know, I think to the question, are we? Is there already a new bi uh, bipolar order? We answer no. But the nature of the system is changing. The system of alliances is changing. The role of the U.S. The last thought I would just, you know, I would push us, and I think this debate helped us do it, not to be only on the menu but actually remain an actor and shape the debate in Poland in order to shape the debate in Europe. Um, you know, maybe the, the ambition of becoming another poll is very high up, but I don't think we are as, um, uh, as just on the sort of reactive mode, uh, that we should be in the reactive mode that we, uh, that we have um, seen in today's, today's discussion. But with this, let me uh, first ask you to join the panel, uh, thank the panelists with me. <laughs> and now we, have a, now we have a little surprise, so I'm passing it on back. One more. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much for your attendance. Uh, thank you very much all the panelists. Um, I would like to also say that uh, today we just uh, introduced our new report about the uh, geo-economy of China. It's uh, circulated over there and uh, Professor uh, Tomasz Grzegorz Grosse is uh, the author. So please um, uh, feel free to take it. Uh, and uh, last but not least, um, I would like to also thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jacek Bartosiak, uh, because uh, he has his birthday today. And even though he came for the debate, <laughs> uh, and here is a symbolic gift from the Nova Confederacja think tank. So I hope it will be a symbolic memory. Thank you very much for your time. And please uh, subscribe to our channel at YouTube and Nova Confederacia website.